It said, I need no other argument. Jesus died for me is enough. Is that enough? You know, I was uh, just so blessed and so encouraged uh, from Palm Sunday to communion <clears throat> to Easter. Who had a great uh, Easter week with the Lord? Who, who just was really blessed? Yeah, what, what an amazing time we had together. I promise today uh, I, I, I'm not going to be blowing your eardrums out of the water. <laughs> but that, that was fun. Um, we're back. And Joshua, and we're going to be finishing Joshua 23 and 24. And I'm so glad and happy that we were in Joshua. It's, it's been a book <coughs> that <coughs> has been very convicting to me and, and what the Lord wants from us and, and how he would, wants us to live. And not only that, what he provides and what he wants to give us and how he'll be there for us uh, through any situation, and how he wants to rain down blessings upon us. So we've had a nice break celebrating Palm Sunday and Easter, but here we are back in Joshua 23 this week, 24 next week. <clears throat> and then after that, I told you we were going to the book of Ephesians, but um, I decided not to do that. Uh, Ephesians is called the New Testament equivalent to Joshua. So I'd just be coming at you, talking to you about many of the same principles that we're learning here in Joshua in, in the church today. So we're going to go to the book of John, and we're going to look at the miracles of Jesus Christ and how uh, Jesus Christ can impact our lives. Excuse me. So who's excited about that? We're going to look at Jesus' miracles. Well, now that we're in the last chapters of this book, and we are in the last chapters of Joshua's life, these are his last words to the people that he has walked with, that he led, that he has fought with for over 70 years. Not fought with them, but fought with them against the enemy. These are some difficult chapters, everybody. They're difficult to hear. But if received properly, if they're applied with a pure heart, these Truths will bring down God's blessing in our lives. And that's what I want for my life. And, and I know you want for yours. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you today. We thank you for your provision. We look around at our building. And Lord, these are just uh, brick, stone, mortar. It's all passing away. But we look at the body, the true church, right here in this sanctuary together. Let us love one another. Let us edify one another. Lord, as we do that, let us praise you and worship you. Let us live a life with a heart desire that wants to please you in everything we do. We thank you, Lord, for our salvation. We thank you for calling us and choosing us. Lord, there's no greater gift, and we possess it. Lord, let it, let it motivate us to want to please you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So here in chapter 23... Joshua calls the leaders of the tribes together, and he's going to pour out his heart to them. And the key verse of his message to them is in Joshua 23, verse 8. Please look there. He says, But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. Joshua here is concerned that though they are holding fast here in verse 8 to the Lord now, that they might be tempted in the future, look at verse 12, to turn away and ally themselves with the nations about them. Look at verse 12. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them. This word ally is the same Hebrew word translated as hold fast there in verse 8. Look at verse 11, so he tells them. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. Joshua here is concerned that though they have a zeal for the Lord right now, as they enjoy rest after all that God had given them and all the victories they've received, that their zeal, that their real love for the Lord in verse 11 might fade through time. It might fade through compromise with the nations around them and even be replaced by other loves. And that's what he's concerned about. Uh oh 
Are we, con- are we not concerned about the very same thing in the church today? Is that not one of the reasons why we as a church and the universal church has to pray for revival? In the Christian life, there is the very real danger and even a tendency to cool off spiritually. I think we've all experienced that at one point or other in our lives. It's a lukewarmness that can truly set in, if not right down to a chilling coldness. The joys, the thrills, the blessings and excitement of our new life in Christ, they become memories. The sacrificial services that we once gladly rendered are now forgotten or they're done grudgingly at times. The things of the Lord become more tedious to that person. Other interests and other loves, they have eaten away at the first love. And the zeal for the Lord starts waning down. Perhaps this describes one or two or three or some of you, maybe none. Perhaps this describes some of the state of the church right now. And I so know some here might even be saying in their mind, Whew, that's me. I remember when I hear these type of sermons, when I wasn't following the Lord wholeheartedly, I knew it was talking to me. I've been there. How do we hold fast to the Lord? How do we avoid lukewarmness that sickens the Lord? We know that in Revelation 3. We know those words of Christ, right? What, what are these things that contribute to the believer's slide to lukewarmness and even a coldness in their life that can lead to a turning away from the Lord altogether and holding fast to other loves in their life? What are these things that contribute? Well, in this chapter... We see Joshua's remedy, though, for holding fast to the Lord. Here in chapter 23, Joshua's going to share with his people his remedy for spiritually holding fast to the Lord. Who wants to truly have that remedy? Who truly wants to have that recipe of knowing how to truly hold fast to the Lord? Well, this this God-given remedy is the same then and for every believer since and to us today. We're going to see that uh, Joshua's going to remind them of a few things. But I want to tell you beforehand, these messages are not fun, but they are healthy. I was talking to Shannon about this off and on this week, and I was even talking to her about it this morning. It's hard for a pastor to preach these type of sermons sometimes. They aren't feel good, but they bring a life of good. They aren't popular, but they do make you popular with God. If applied. And that's what I care about. I know that's what you care about. So here's the overview. Joshua calls the leaders together and he reminds them of the true source of all their blessings and the true source of all their victories in uh, verses 1 through 5. He then exhorts them to hold fast to the Lord and to love him with all of their heart and all of their lives in verses 6 through 11. And then he gives them the warning He warns them of the dire consequences should they fail to do so in verses 12 through 16. But before we uh, go into this, we look at Joshua. Look at what he says to the people. Let's look at what Joshua says about himself. Look at verse 2. What's he say? He says, I am old and well advanced in years. Look at verse 14. I am about to go the way of all the earth. We know from Joshua 24, 29, that Joshua's going to die at 110 years old. He's going to be 110. Just how close he is to that age as he addresses the leaders here, we're not sure, but we do know he's very close. But isn't it refreshing to hear someone face the facts and say, I'm old. You know? Uh, I tell you, there was a senior citizen who was driving down the freeway. And his cell phone rang. And answering, he heard his wife's urgent voice warning him. She said, Herman, I just heard on the news that there's a car going the wrong way on Interstate 77. Please be careful, Herman. Well, thanks, honey. But it's not just one car. It's hundreds of them. (laughs) Oh, man. Getting old. Getting old. (laughs) I tell you, billions and billions, 
More, do more dollars are spent in America alone, in this country, every year on age-reducing, age-hiding, age-defying creams and potions, surgeries to lift every part of the body that age is bringing down, all to ward off what no one can. Getting old. But getting old is not bad. Everyone is going the way of all the earth, which is death. Some may never reach old age, but everyone we know, we talked about last week, will go the way of all the earth. Aren't we here glad today that as we saw last week, as those believers who are in Christ, though they die physically, they're going to go the way of all the earth. They will never die spiritually. They will never die eternally. Remember that last week? Praise God for that. No believer need be like the world fighting and fearful of old age and death. For, to, In my opinion, to the believer, the older you get, the closer you are to glory, statistically speaking. It's, it's a abiding principle. <laughs> but you know, it's kind of like in the military. Ed, all you guys in the military, you remember when in the military, when you were about to ETS and you were about to get out of the military, we all went around going, sure. Sure, and you would tease all the new people that you were about to get out to freedom. Well, the older we get, the shorter we are eternally. We're going to be with the Lord. Praise God for that. Hmm. I look forward to that, that day that we're all going to be in glory with the Lord. So we see Joshua's 110. He's getting near 110 years old. He's getting ready to go the way of all the earth. So let's now look at what Joshua says to the leaders there. He reminds them of the true source of all their blessings and all their victories in verses 1 through 5. Though Israel had to go and they had to fight the nations and they had to occupy the promised land, it was not by their might, we know that, it was not by their power that they were victorious. That victorious uh, campaign was a result of what God had done and, they, and that God had fought for them. And even the victories that they will have in the future over the remaining pockets of resistance will be because of the Lord. Verse 9, look at it. It reminds them again that their astonishing victories against all odds was because the Lord their God fought for them. Look at 23.9. The Lord has driven out before you. Look at verse 8 and then 11 and 12. I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you. Verse 11. But I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. God did it. All in fulfillment of his promise to them. Look at 23 verse 5. The Lord your God himself will push out for your sake. He will drive them out before you, and you will take possession of the land as the Lord your God promised you. Verse 10. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you, just as he promised. And I absolutely, positively love that. Just as he promised, but one of you can route a thousand. Can you imagine that? If God promised it, he can do it. God promised to them the land. God promised that no man would be able to stand before them. And Joshua reminded them. So he goes on to remind them that the rest they have experienced now for a long time, about 25 years now, was given to them by God himself. Rest for a long time given by God. He also reminds them that all their blessings in the land that they were now enjoying, were all graciously given to them by God through no merit of their own. Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 11. They were told there, there was nothing in Israel that made God choose them. There was nothing about Israel that made God bless them. They were not mighty. They were not numerous. They were not this bad to the bone nation. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 9, 4 through 5 talk about this. God, it says there, God just chose to love and bless them apart from any merit of their own. Kind of sounds like, like me. Isn't that just like the believer today? 
God in his sovereignty and his grace and his love for us, he chose us and he blessed us with salvation and every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, Ephesians 1, 3 says. How do we know? Through no merit of, on our part. But simply, what's it simply by? According to the purpose of his will, Ephesians 1, 11. And just as God made certain promises to Israel, so Jesus has made promises to all who would believe in him. Eternal life, his power, his presence, his peace, his love, his guidance and wisdom, etc. Promises he will, as with Israel, keep. Do you believe that? It's all from God. It's all about God. It's from God, so we should praise God. And you know, that's amazing when we really see ourselves compared to God. The Apostle Paul himself asked this question in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. He asked, what do you have that you did not receive? Answer, nothing. All we have is from God. This was true of Israel and it is true of the believer today. And Joshua wanted to remind them that their source of all their blessings and all their victory was from God himself. And we would do good to remind ourselves of the very same thing. So now, the next thing, he exhorts them to hold fast to the Lord and love him only all their lives. 6 through 11. Have you ever thought of what it means to hold fast to the Lord? What's it really mean when you really hold fast to the Lord? This word is variously translated as to cling to, to be joined to, to be united with, to stay close, to pursue, to remain steadfast. But when you really think about it, those words hardly convey the tightness with which we are to hold fast. They seem to fall short a little bit. In uh, Job 38, 38, it is used of dust becoming hard and the cause of the earth that it says in the verse, stick together. In 2 Kings 11 and 2 and elsewhere, it is used of leprosy, clinging to the body of Naaman. In 2 Samuel 23.10, it's used of Eleazar, one of David's three mighty men, remember, who when Israel was threatened by the Philistines and Israel retreated, he said in 23.10, he stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to a sword. That's the same word. Froze to a sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory there. We really need to be men and women of the Lord that stand our ground today before modern day Philistines and not retreat. We need to be this type of people. But the best example of what it means to hold fast to the Lord is seen in Job 41, 15 through 17. You can turn there if you'd like to, but I'll read it to you. Speaking about Leviathan or the large beast. The word joined is the Hebrew word hold fast. Look at how it's described. Its back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between them. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. The NASV says they are joined one to another and cannot be separated. So we are to... So hold fast to the Lord. We are to stick so close to him, be so tightly sealed together that not even air can pass between us. Now do you start getting the point? Clinging to. I can remember, I don't know if Alice is here today. There she is. Christian Academy. Alice was my second grade school teacher. But I remember going to kindergarten for the first time. Uh, in my mind, like never before, it's just there. My dad dropped me off and Mrs. Thomas flashed by. I just got up, ran out, went down those stairs, went into the gymnasium where the cops were, and poof, I tackled my dad's leg. I clung to him like their life. You parents know this. It's like that baby that clings to you and you try to give it to somebody else that comes back to you and and, and just cries and only wants mom or dad. That's a bad example of, of what it really means to have no air between you and God to cling to him. We are to stay so close to him that absolutely nothing, I mean nothing can part us or separate us from him. 
In Deuteronomy 10.20, Moses, just like Joshua, is calling Israel to hold fast to the Lord. And in verse 12, you can go over there if you'd like, Deuteronomy 10.20. But verse 12, Moses asked a question of Israel. And of us today, that explains what that means. Look there, please. Go to Deuteronomy 10. Verse 12, what does the Lord your God ask of you? So he says, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with, us, and with all your soul. So what does God ask of us? Hey, let's not dilute the impact of what God is asking by the second east one of these fivefold elements. Let's just step back and look with wondering eyes here a minute. Fear God, walk with God, love God, serve God, observe or obey God. What is God saying? What was Joshua really saying to the people? What was he really saying? Is he not saying, I want you what God requires, what God asks is not just something from us, but it's actually us. What I require of you is you. I want everything you have, everything you are. I want you to fear me, obey me, love me, serve me, cling to me. I want us to be inseparable in our relationship. I want my will to be your will. I want to be the song on your lips, the joy of your life. I want your very soul. I want all of it. I want your heart. I want all of it. I want all your life for all your life. I want all your life for all your life. That's what God's saying. Whew. That sounds like God is requiring total, exclusive allegiance to him alone. Man. It sounds like he is requiring of them that he be the absolute Lord over them and that they be wholeheartedly his. And that's exactly what he's doing. Does that sound like too much to ask? Is that too much to require? Look again at those words in Deuteronomy 10.12 at the beginning. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But two, but two, what does he ask of you but to just do this? Moses presents this as the most natural response they could give to God. Not a ridiculous one. It is not presented as something more than God should ask of them. But it's actually presented as the very least they should give to him. Namely, total surrender for who he is and all he has done for them. Look at the first incentive to hold fast in Deuteronomy 12.20 to him. What is it that requires this all-out surrender? God is. He is not just some other guy. He's not just the man upstairs. He's not just a bigger version of us. He's not just the God we create in our own mind. He's the creator He's your maker. He is the God of all gods, the Lord of all lords. He is the great God, mighty and awesome, the only one true God. He has to stoop to observe this tiny planet. He flung the stars into space. He hung the earth on nothing. He's marked the heavens and he's calculated the dust of the earth. Look, look at verse 15 there in, in Deuteronomy 12 still. He says, yet... Yet the Lord loved you, Israel, and chose you. Oh, the wonder of it all. The wonder of it all. That should be, that should be enough incentive. Enough for Israel to hold fast to him and to serve him only with all their heart, all their days. The last few weeks we've looked at, uh, at what Jesus has done for us. There's more than enough incentive to give God, to give Jesus every last bit of us. And God requires no less of Israel and he requires no less of the church today in the church days. Do you believe that? 
Yeah, Paul says in Romans 12, 1, that in light of all God's mercies towards us, total surrender is not unreasonable. It is just our reasonable act of worship. Not unreasonable, not burdensome, not half-hearted, not lukewarm. He who in his great love, he chose us, he called us, he redeemed us through the sacrifice of his dear son, Jesus Christ. And now he requires that our lives be flipped for his glory, to fear him, to walk in his ways and to serve him and obey him with all our hearts and souls. And that's what he's requiring of us. And if that commitment to him, if that commitment takes everything we have and it costs us everything we hold dear in this life to hold fast and be true to him, even if it causes us to lay down our very lives, we should be able to say, so be it. It's not too much. It's the least we can do in return of your great love for me, Jesus. You, you know? I firmly believe that this is the problem with the health and the wealth gospel. The watered-down gospel, that false gospel, that shallow, superficial Christianity that permeates the lives of the church today is that God is here to serve us and that God is here to obey us. You've all heard it before. You've heard it. It permeates through the country. It permeates through the culture. What has God done for me? What is the church doing for me? What am I getting from the church? How am I being fed? How does the music affect me? And to top it all off, you know what? These people rarely even serve. They aren't even in the Word and have very little heart for the church. They have very little heart for their brothers and sisters. And last, let alone, very little heart for the Lord. And this is what's happening in superficial Christianity today. But God's sitting here saying, I want all of you. I want every last bit of you. I tell you, the church today needs to get over its view of God as existing to meet its needs. They need to be a church where they are at the beck and call of God and they want to get back to asking what he requires of them. The early church shook up their world because they were more concerned with God's demands of them than their demands of God. They were more burdened about what God wanted from them rather than the, what they wanted from the Lord. We really got to get back to this attitude today if we were to make an impact in the world of, for God today. To make a real impact in the world, we have to get on fire for the Lord and we have to go tell people that God wants us to be committed and follow him fully because that's where the richest, truest blessings flow. I'm blown away. I truly am blown away at the lack of real zeal of many Christians today in their service and in their heart for the Lord. The scariest thing, though, is how offended people become when you address it with them. You've talked to a brother or sister in the Lord that you have a heart or burden for. They don't want to hear it. And that's when we have to pray for one another. We really should be, I'm going off topic here, but we really should be praying for each other every day. Do you pray for each other every day? If you pray for each other every day, that God keep us strong, that God keep us motivated, that God keep us loving him. That's loving each other. We must pray that we are not like they. That we not only want to give all of us to the Lord, but would love to. Did you hear that part? Not that we want to, but that we would love to. Because we really see ourselves in comparison to God. If you really see yourself how you are in comparison to God and what he's done for you. So, what was true for Israel is true for us today. So Joshua tells him in 23, 6, be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. That's what he says to them there in verse 6. Simply put, this is low-hanging fruit here. Anyone can grab it. This is called submission. Who likes the word submission? Not Americans. Not us Americans. I don't think any people do. Of course, Joshua says obey. And we have talked much about obedience in the study of Joshua because God talks about it. But the deeper issue behind obedience is the submission of my will to the will of God. It's that simple. My will or his will. Not a ball and chain obedience out of a rebellious nature, but a willful, loving desire to please. A willful, 
loving desire to please. Today, rebellion is in. Rebellion is cool. Rebellion is the cool thing. The overthrow of constituted authority is in. And the magnification of doing your own thing is in. Do you all agree with that? We see it in schools. We see it in homes. We see it in the workplace. Few today accept orders gracefully. Few are willing to subject their wills or their agendas to another person. This is plainly visible throughout the church today. There are seminars now bringing pastors together to talk about the lack of submission to God-appointed leadership in the church. Right down to children in the classroom that are disobedient to their teachers. This is permeating the school. This is permeating the church. Rebelliousness. This is tragic, though, if it happens in the Christian life. The truth is, a believer that refuses to submit to God's word as it speaks to them about their life, they're really, they're really truly walking at odds with God. We have seen this over again in Joshua, that God will not allow that to go on for long before he does something about it, right? He, he won't allow that for long. Whew. Hebrews 12, 6 through 11. It tells us that if we are true children of God, he will discipline us when we are disobedient, just as our human fathers do. Man. We're supposed to like and love God's reproof, aren't we? Who likes being disciplined? I didn't think so. So we should avoid it. Praise the Lord, though. God loves us that way. Notice that when fathers lovingly and consistently discipline, they gain the respect of their children. Failure to do this in your own children breeds disrespect and an unsubmissive spirit in your children. There are a few things more detrimental to a child in today's society than an absentee father. Oh, a father may be in the home, but that doesn't make him there. But praise God, our loving father... He's never absentee. And he will discipline us when needed because he loves us and he knows what is best for us. I am very truly thankful that God loves me so much. He knows what's best for me. He's not just going to let me flounder into sin because he loves me. So in Hebrews 12, 9, Paul makes the call also to submission. He says, how much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Here is the call to submission to the Father of our spirits whose only goal is to do good. Did you hear me? His only goal is to do good and enrich your lives by producing His holiness in us, it says in Hebrews 12.10. He wants to do us good. Come on, amen to that. God wants to do you good. Holding fast, though, to the Lord means that when the Word speaks revealing some sin in our life, some wrong habit in our lives, or a relationship that's wrong, an unloving or unforgiving spirit, that we should submit to his word, we should submit to his will, and we should move to truly correct it. That should be our desire. We should never just stubbornly hold fast to what we want to do, but rather we let go of it, and in humble submission hold fast to our Lord and obey and do his will. That will bring the true blessings in your life. Even now, to many of those to many of uh, those words bring forth a rebellious spirit in our world. Maybe even some here today, I don't know, are inwardly cringing at those words or have already tuned me out. I don't know. I hope not. I pray to God not. Please know this, please. This is the words and message of God, not me, not man. True submission to him will bring the greatest joy in living. I don't care what anyone tells you. If you walk along a lukewarm Christian who's living their life, they're not in the Word, they're not in prayer, they don't care about coming to church, and when they do come, it's just to keep faith. If you've met anyone like that, don't believe what they tell you. They are not happy. They are not joyful. If they tell you anything different, it's a what? It's a lie. Don't fall into that trap. Submission, everyone. 
brings real fulfillment. And it brings joy because that's when you're the closest with no error you'll ever be to God. That's when you're clinging to him the most, holding fast to him the most. And that is the greatest place to be. Do you agree? So next he says, look at Joshua 23, 7 and 8. Do not associate with the nations that remain among you. This is called separation. So submission and separation. We have submission to God. Now separate from something. Well, this association is clarified in verse 12 as inner marriage for the Israelites there. This is the first time in Joshua that intermarriage is even brought up. But remember, Moses gave the same command and the reason why. It was not a racial thing. It was a spiritual thing. Look at Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 4. He says, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will Turn your children away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. You know, God, he certainly knows the power and influence that a woman can have on a man. After all, God created him. If you're a man, who knows the influence a woman can have on a man? (laughs) Yeah, we do. Famous example of this, of one who ignored this command, was King Ahab. Remember? He married the Sidonian pagan Jezebel. We all know what happened there. And then led Ahab to worship other gods of Baal. Ahab was already a wicked man, so he was easy pickings. He was already wicked. But what about King Solomon, the son of King David? Solomon was the wisest man on earth, tremendously blessed by God. He built the magnificent temple to God and he wrote scripture and he wrote Proverbs about wisdom. King Solomon loved God. A spiritual giant like Solomon could not fall, could he? Well, just go read 1 Kings 11, 1 through 8 for his tragic story. What about Samson? Uh Uh-oh, you know what happened to him. Right? Wow. Wow. It's really not about us today in interracial marriage. It's nothing racial at all. It has a deeper meaning for the church today. When we will learn that obeying God is always the best course to take. Yet today, look at the many young men and women that enter marriage with non-believers. They bind themselves together, 2 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15, with an unbeliever, and they wonder why they have so many issues. It amazes me today. It really blows my mind how parents of youth allow kids to date non-believers and then adults who date non-believers and then wonder why the mess happens. I refuse to allow my girls to date until they're ready. But they all know the very first thing they must ascertain before even letting themselves even contemplate dating is if that person is what? A believer. Why do it? Why shut yourself up? So the Israelites, they were to stay clear of the Canaanites and their immoral, idolatrous idolatrous lifestyles. And you know what? Archaeological studies and historical documents have confirmed the utter depravity of those nations surrounding Israel. They worshipped other gods and they involved fertility rites, sexual orgies, and they even burned their children to give to other gods. You can see that in Deuteronomy 12 and 2 Kings 3. And this is what God's warned them about. Today, the Bible tells Christians to not mix it up with the sins of the world. We're not to get it on with the sins of the world. Don't mix it up there. To not serve the gods of the world. We're not to be lovers of success and money and personal fame. We're not to bow down to the world's standards, its values, or its priorities. This is dangerous when we do it. Today, what's the Bible do? It calls, calls all Christians to, it says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from among them and be separate. And in 6, 17, then to positively pursue, in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, holiness. Not to be completely apart from the world, but not to be of the world. We're to be in it, not of it. Because when you become of it, mm-mm, that's when it goes bad. He says, therefore... Since we have have these promises, dear friends, 
Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of the reverence for God. There it is. It's back to the proper perspective of God. This is not easy. Who thinks it's easy? You must be very strong, it says in the Lord, and you must be careful back in Joshua 23, verse 6. For the things of this world are constantly exerting pressure on us to conform us and to compromise our lives. Romans 12, 2. Be very careful, people, when you decide to take those first steps towards compromise with the world. Notice the progression in Joshua 23, 7. Please look there. Brought out more clearly in the NASB. It says, so that you will not associate with these nations, these which remain among you, or mention the name of their gods, or make anyone swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. Look at the progression. It begins with association. It moves to mentioning the names of the gods, then swearing by those gods, then serving those gods, then finally all out worshiping or bowing down to those gods. That's scary. I'm here to tell you, worldliness, when first stepped into, has a way of growing one deeper and deeper into it like quicksand. Your lifestyle may not, listen, your lifestyle may not be openly immoral. It may not even be openly worldly. It may just smack of the secular. But the world and all of its alluring ways has a corrupting influence that deadens and desensitizes us. Our lifestyles may not be openly immoral, but what about the heart? It may smack of the world. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta really guard against that. What happens to us when we fall into sin? I can go back and do the big testimony of my life back when I was 18 through 22, 16 through 22. I don't have time for that right now. But here's what happens, and the Bible teaches you: you begin to tolerate little sins in your life. Small things that pamper the flesh and we begin to compromise for the sake of comfort or compromise for the sake of convenience. And soon those compromises lead us to an even greater levels of toleration in our life of what we know in our hearts. We do know this in our hearts that is not pleasing to the Lord. And before long, we're holding fast, not to the Lord, but we're holding fast to the pull of the world more than to the Lord and our Savior. And soon it starts to happen. Then we find that call of God is annoying. That call to service is cutting into our time. And we find ourselves doing the minimum that Christianity requires to look like a Christian. And next thing you know, lukewarmness sets in. And then coldness has set in. That's what God's warning against. So let's not be cocky people. This can happen to anyone who bears from the Lord. In fact, it will happen to anyone who bears from the Lord and clings less to God. And so messages like this are to warn God, these are God's word because he loves us and we should love each other. We do not want this to happen to any one of us. So we see his call to submission and separation. We're getting near the end. Let's look at this other call. Go to 23.8. Hold fast to the Lord, your God, as you have until now. This is called devotion. God doesn't expect us to cool off. He doesn't expect us to drift, drift away. He expects us to cling to him until the day he comes to me and takes me to glory. Okay? The zeal, listen, the zeal of the early church, the apostles and the apostle Paul, as they held fast to the Lord Jesus against every weapon formed against them, it was not to be the exception, but the rule and expectation for every believer. Not the exception, but the expectation. Do you see the difference? So he says in verse 6, be very strong. God has given them the strength to overcome their enemies. And he can and will give them the strength to continue to hold fast to him and live victorious even in a pagan culture to those who are careful to do this thing, to set their heart to do what God tells them to do. Look at verse 11. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. Be very careful to love him. This is not the fourth item, but rather what submission, separation, and devotion really mean. This is the motive for doing them. When I obey what the Lord says, when I refuse to associate with anything or anyone that might tempt me to stray from or leave the Lord, when I faithfully, faithfully hold fast to my Lord, 
as the only God and the only source of all my blessings in this world, that's just loving God. It's, it's just loving him as he deserves. The words be very careful are literally this, to take care for your very soul. They are to be faithful to God exclusively and to love him exclusively for their life's sake, for their very own soul's sake. I'm here, listen, everybody, the best thing you can do for your life, the very best thing you can do for your life, for your soul's sake, is to be faithful to God, is to hold fast to him, and to love him with all your heart. It's true love. Love was to be the motive for submission. It was to be the motive for separation. It's to be the motive for devotion. Listen to this very carefully if you don't get much out of this today. You must know the difference with what I'm about to tell you because the difference is night and day. You want to make sure you're in the day. When there is separation without devotion, it's legalism. When there is submission without love, it is hypocrisy. Are you with me? You want to do it right from the heart. All these failures to obey, failures to separate from sin and world, and they say, go back to a failure in our devotion to the Lord. It's a failure, really, in our love for him. Jesus cuts to the heart of it when he said, if you love me, you'll, you will obey me. If we really love our Lord, we're going to want to hold fast to him. And with all our hearts, not allow anything to come between us. I am so thankful, though, that I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not sinless. That's why I needed the cross with Jesus Christ on it, coming down, rising again, paying the price for my sin. Praise God, I can get that forgiveness. We're talking about a hard attitude. We want to live lives that would not displease him or grieve him. Not the one I love. The one I love. We dumb down that word so bad. I love ice cream. I love pizza. I love this. I love that. I love... What, man, not this kind of love. Do I love my Lord? If we really love the Lord, the Bible tells us that we cannot want to uh, do wrong against the Lord. How can we not want to know him more? Know more about his word? How can we not want to worship him every Sunday and talk with him in prayer? I'm not saying 100% of attendance at church has to be. I know. Look at all my grandparents. Look at all my people. You got babies to go see. and so We got to travel. We got to do things. We're talking about a lifestyle, right? How can we not be devoted to him on Sunday? I guarantee you, if you're not devoted to the Lord on Sundays, and you don't love Sundays, you don't do, either do it Monday through Saturday either. Let's just be honest. When we seldom pray, when we seldom read the word, and we seldom worship regularly, it is really the truth because we do not love the Lord as we ought. We are not really devoted to him only. We have allowed the world to cling on to us. Something has happened. Ours should be the desire of Paul expressed in Philippians 3.10. After 30 years of service, after 30 years since he was converted, he still wants to know Jesus, not know more about Jesus. This is what's awesome. But to know Jesus. The Amplified Bible, it goes wild in trying to describe this single word no. It doesn't really know how to really Translate this word no, and it goes bonkers in doing it. Listen to this. That I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. That's the best they could do with that word no. That I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. Perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. <laughs> Nowhere between us, Lord. Sorry about that. That is devotion. That is love for the person of Jesus Christ. That is love for the Lord. When we are more devoted to him the, than we are to the world and its attractions, as the hymn says, we'll automatically the world will grow strangely dim. Do you believe that? Are the things of this world dim in your vision? Or are they so bright you have to become blinded, to, that you have become blinded to the Lord? Some Christians stare into the flames of the world so long they blind themselves. Let's not do that. When we are lukewarm, cool, or indifferent to the things of God, the answer to our problem can be found in one of these three areas, submission, 
Verse 6, separation. 7 and 8, or devotion. And finally, I'm going to close with this. I, this is not fun stuff here, but the warning is, if we obey it, it's going to bring joy. That brings us to the third thing Joshua says to these leaders. He warns them of the dire consequences that they failed to do so. He goes, but if you turn away, you will perish from this good land. So let's keep things in mind. Let's keep contextually things in mind here. The difference between Israel and the church are very important. The promises God gave to Israel are associated with the good land, verses 15 and 16. These promises of the land of milk and honey and all the blessings that went with it were conditional promises based upon Israel's faithfulness to the law and faithfulness to the Lord. So we're not talking about individual personal salvation, which is by faith and by grace alone, and salvation is unconditional. Amen? We're not talking about that. God's not going to come whip your salvation away from you. Look at verses 14 through 15 of chapter 23. Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all God, all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so He will bring on you all the evil things He has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land He has given you. Wow, can you imagine being there, hearing Joshua say that to you? Just as he said, God has kept every good promise, he will also keep his word to remove you from his good land if you violate the covenant. Verse 16, right there, violate the covenant and serve other gods. Well, Moses did this too. He put it to the nation in Deuteronomy 28. He laid out the promises of blessings that they fully obeyed the Lord in 28.1. And the promises of the curses, if they did not, the curses start in verse 15 through 68. Deuteronomy 28, 63 through 34 is the culmination it has reached. Listen to this. I couldn't believe this. Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and curses chapter. There are four times as many curses as the blessings. Do you think God wants them to get something, wants us to get something? You go study Jesus Christ. We're going into that two weeks. We're going to look at his miracles. I want you to go look at this. Jesus talked about hell way more than he ever talked about eternal life. Remember what we learned last week? He was concerned about spiritual life and spiritual death. He wants us to take heed from the warning because he doesn't want to do that. He wants you to repent and come to him. Sadly, Israel did not hold fast to the Lord as a nation. And God took them out of the land and scattered them among all the nations. And the Jew became this in Deuteronomy 28, 37. The Jew became object of the scorn and ridicule to all the nations where the Lord drove them from. Just as God said it would happen. Why? Why? Because they did not serve the Lord their God joyfully and gladly in Deuteronomy 28, 47. Nor did they keep the words of the law or revere God's glorious and awesome name. Deuteronomy 28, 58. The history of Israel is a living testimony to the high price of disobedience. We so often do not hear this message. It is not popular in the church today. But God seems to drive it home over and over in his word. Jesus talked much more about hell, as I told you, than he ever did about heaven. And in Deuteronomy 28, I just couldn't believe the disparaging numbers between the two groups. God takes sin very seriously, but he also loves us enough to warn us away from the results opposite to the blessing. Praise God, God wants to give us the blessings, right? Joshua's generation, though, his generation was holding fast to the Lord, but thereafter a slide down and away from the Lord began and then went from hot to lukewarm to cold. And you know what happened to Israel. We must guard against this in our life. In closing, I want to make a plea to you. I've experienced this in my own life. I'll tell you firsthand, and the Word of God tells you this. This conspiracy happened in the Christian life. As we move through the Christian life, you would think that things would get easier. They don't. That's the dangers of lukewarmness, the dangers of coldness, and even failure would be beyond us. 
Yet our flesh is weak all the days of our lives. There is no point where you are safe. There is no point where you can say, I have arrived. I am safe. I will never fail. Joshua knew that, which is why he spoke these words of warning. Through the Holy Spirit, though, we can be victorious in all aspects of our life. Do you believe that? Perhaps as you look back on your Christian life, you can recall those ambitions for purity. Maybe you can recall those ambitions for holiness that you felt so many years ago, so strong. Those desires to share the gospel, where are they now, you may ask yourself. I'm not accusatorily saying this to everybody. I'm asking you to look into your heart. The battle never becomes easier as we seek to grow in the Lord. There is always the danger of cooling off, the slacking off effort, and a loss of momentum mentally, spiritually, and physically. And I know, you know what I'm talking about. There may not be right, outright apostasies with Israel, but mentally, old truths become simply rehashed, and there's nothing new about them. They are no longer fresh, and they're no longer vital. There's no more growth in the knowledge of the Word. There's no more deep-seated hunger for God. And spiritually, there can be a tendency to live in past experiences, past victories. Living on past victories is the guarantee to current defeats, everybody. It's the same in business. Living in past victories, not improving, is the guarantee of going out of business. It's the same with marriage. It's the same with relationships. You've got to constantly be working on your marriage relationships. It's the same with the Lord. Daily we have to be striving after Him. Why is it that sin does not so easily shame us anymore? Why is it that sin in our life does not drive us to our knees in repentance? Why do calls to holiness not move the church age today? Things that attack our biblical convictions or even our Lord no longer bring out the fight in us. Sometimes you think we're, not no, longer, we're no longer holding fast as we ought. If you're at a point in your life where your grip is slipping or you're cooling off and the status quo seems all right, there's a quick turnaround you can make. You can turn back to Jesus. You can pray for forgiveness. He will be swift to forgive you and start worshiping him and putting him first in your life. What happens when we start drifting away? While we are not Israel, the church today, there's some spiritual truths we can take from God's warning to Israel. God said to Israel that should they ever turn away, he would no longer fight for them. The land of milk and honey would not, no longer be theirs. To the believer today who does not hold fast to the Lord, we can experience some of the things, same things. A lack of victories in our life, verse 13. A lack of joy in our life, verse 13. Are snares and traps and whips and thorns here in verse 13? Are they part of your life? When we begin to compromise in the areas of faithfulness, obedience, and sin, life seems to become a thicket of one trouble after another. Who's ever been stuck in, a, in thorn bushes? You ever hiking through the woods, whatever? <laughs> Jerry has a place behind his house. Uh, I think it was I fall. <laughs> we went back there. Remember? We go that, you know, had the nice clothes on. He's like, Hey, let's go back. We went back there and we were popping off some rounds in the woods. We come up. Remember we came out and had all those burrs all over us? You remember? We're like, tch, 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 tch. I mean, just filled. We're, we're even taking our pants and going. I'm thinking, man, that's like sin. That's what happens when I entangle myself in the world. And the lack of joy leaves your life. It doesn't have to be that way. Then what happens is a lack of peace in verse 16. The Lord's anger burned against him. There is the peace we have with God through the blood. But there is a peace of God that comes when we are in fellowship with him. When we are out of fellowship with him, with him we are out of peace. God has to send more, spend more time working on us than in us to do his good will. Let's not do that. So what is Joshua's remedy? Submission to the Lord. Please submit to the Lord in all aspects of your life. Look in your heart. Separation from the world. Wherever the world is invading you and clinging to you, uncling from it and cling to the Lord. Devotion to God in all things. This theme runs throughout the Bible for all believers in any age. And certainly for the church today, it's over and over and over again in time. This theme is over and over and over again. If there is a lack of power in your life, if there is a lack of joy or peace in your life, it is because you are not holding fast and you have lost the grip somewhere along the way.
But praise God, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can grip back on. Do you believe it? And if you are gripped on, grip on tighter. Grip on tighter. Praise God, we can always, like Paul, come to know him more. Isn't that wonderful that he wants to know us more? A good place, if you're there, to begin to hold fast is to go back in prayer. Psalm 139.23 Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. In humble submission, ask God to search your heart and point out any offensive way in you. In the areas of your submission or your separation or your devotion to him, and then be willing to change what he reveals and as he leads you into the way everlasting. Who knows we're going into the way everlasting? Right? Right? So praise God for that. Let's humble ourselves. Let's get back to the power. Let's get back to the joy and the peace of the Lord. Do it for your soul's sake. Do it for your love for the Lord. God will answer that prayer. He will come faithfully and help you in a heartbeat. I promise. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, these, these can be hard things to hear. Lord, submission, separation, devotion. Lord, we as sinful people, with our old man, we wrestle against these things. Lord, there's every single one of us here today, every one of us, can find areas in our life where we can cling to you more, where we can let no air between. Lord, search our hearts. If there's any way in us that is displeasing to you, let us rid ourselves of it through your power, through your strength. Lord, what amazes me is that you give us these texts, these passages, to warn us. But the opposite is how much you want to bless us and love us. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, your ultimate gift. Lord, I thank you for, our, for, for the forgiveness of our sins. I thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, let us be people who really want to please you. And all we say, all we do, how we act in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives, everywhere. Lord, let us give all of us to you, our soul, our hearts and mind, every part of us, Lord, is yours. Let us treat you that way, with love. Let us love you, Lord. Please convict our hearts today in any area need be. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this body of believers. I thank you that we can come together, Lord, as we support one another, encourage one another, to live a life worthy of our calling because we are all united with you in salvation. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen.